Russia and her moves into Syria and how this is connected to Bible prophecy and we will link on to the events that have just happened this weekend. Now some of you may have come here as a result of the interview that David gave on the Northampton radio a week last Sunday and Martin Heath asked David this question, more or less paraphrased. But people have been seeing signs for years, for centuries of, of the second coming, and to the best of our knowledge, it hasn't actually happened yet. Of course. Is there a danger in, in finding these signs and saying mm. to people, this is a sign of this happening, when it then doesn't, mm. it, well, it, it doesn't really sort of do the, the, the reputation of the faith any good? And David pointed out that that was a question that was... Uh, echoed 2,000 years ago by the Apostle Peter, who answered the same question to his generation. He, in his recorded in the second letter of Peter, in the third chapter, he talked about knowing this first, that in scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. They will say, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. So that's a question that has been asked for a long time. And what Peter points out, the not inconsiderable matter, that things haven't con continued always as they were from the beginning, there was a little incident of the worldwide flood in the days of Noah, when God punished that, that generation, Noah's generation, because they refused to acknowledge and serve the Lord God who made heaven and earth. And he taught his readers to look at these things through God's eyes. And uh, two or three verses uh, later on in verse 9, he says, The Lord is not slow to fulfil his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So he's saying to his readers, well, think of this from God's point of view. He is allowing you the opportunity, and that reaches out to us tonight, our opportunity to listen to God's word and to heed it and wait for this great event of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, we admit 2,000 years has gone by since Jesus ascended into the heavens, but one day it will happen. And it was Franklin Benjamin that said there are only two certain things in life, that's taxes and death. <coughs> One day, we know unless the Lord comes, we're going to die. We know we're getting older. But the reality of the day of our death is something which is hard to contemplate. Earlier this year, I caught my wife up and had my 71st birthday, so I was the same age as she. And then three weeks later, she was diagnosed with inoperable cancer. And three weeks later, she had fallen asleep. Now, we didn't know that her time would be so brief. We thought it would be months. But using the phrase that Jesus used, her life, as it were, was caught away like a thief in the night. And nothing prepared us for those few minutes which mark the difference between life and death. The suddenness took everybody's surprise, even their own doctor. But that's what Jesus says. My coming is going to be like that. You're, you're going to be snatched away, as it were, unawares. Mm. And yet the signs are there. And this is what we have to face. How do we know that Jesus is coming? Well, Jesus has given us signs. God has given us many stepping stones which lead to that event of his coming. And we can see, well, this has happened, that has happened, that has happened. And so we must be getting closer and closer to the coming of the Lord Jesus. But first of all, we need to know why Jesus is going to come back to the earth. So why is Jesus coming back? This is a question that we need to know so that the rest that we're going to talk about all make sense. <clears throat> this passage from Luke chapter 1 here are verses which are going to be frequently cited in the next few weeks as we run up to Christmas. It's the account that Luke gives us of the angel Gabriel coming to Mary. And... Uh, 
part way down there, she, he greets Mary with greetings, O favoured one, the Lord is with you. She was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favour with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. But note the words that the angel continued with. He shall be great, and he shall be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give unto him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Now that hasn't happened yet. Jesus was born King of the Jews. He lived as King of the Jews. He died, didn't he, as King of the Jews? And God raised him from the dead. But he is not yet the King of the Jews. He has gone into heaven. He is coming back in order to be, to fulfil these words, to be the King of the Jews, to reign on David's throne in Jerusalem, not only over Israel, but over the whole world. And consider his last words to his disciples. Recorded in Acts chapter 1, they were walking together 40 years, 40 years, 40 days after the uh, resurrection, and they had gone up the Mount of Olives and over the other side down to Bethany. And the disciples were talking to Jesus as they went, and they posed this question, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And no, Jesus answered. He didn't say, no, you've got it all wrong. The kingdom of God is in your hearts or the kingdom of God is in heaven. His reply was, it's not for you to know when that kingdom is going to be. So he clearly was expecting that at some time in the Father's good pleasure, that the Father has fixed in his own authority, that he was going to come to establish and restore that kingdom to Israel. And while they were talking to him, he ascended, and angels then spoke to them and said, This Jesus, who is taken up from you into heaven, will so come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. And the disciples believed that Jesus was going to come back. Not publicly, but in secret, to the disciples, first of all, before he reveals himself to Israel and then to the world. So this is the background. Jesus Christ is coming back. God has made promises. They will be fulfilled. And so we look for that day when he comes back. <clears throat> and because he is coming back as king of the Jews, it's not surprising that many of the stepping stones which uh, he has given, God has given in the Bible, relate to Israel. As I say, God has given us these stepping stones. Now the first one is a very general one. We believe, the Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 1, that God took six days in order to create the heavens and the earth, and he rested on the seventh day. And that forms a kind of miniature of God's overall work. For 6,000 years, this earth has been under the control of man. And the Bible tells us that the kingdom of God, when Jesus comes back in its initial phase, lasts a thousand years. And so we can see that creation was a miniature of God's long-term plan. Now, obviously, if you believe in evolution, that won't mean much. But uh, let's look at some more recognisable stepping stones. So I've I put a series of events in a random order, and let's just put them in the right order on the right stepping stones. And the first event is World War I, and a rather enigmatic turkey dried up, and we'll explain what this is all about. Just some general sweeps, just at the moment. Then that allowed the Jews, who had been scattered around the whole world, to return to their home. And they had begun to come before then, but in increasing numbers they came back to their homeland, still are coming back uh, over the past 90 years. Now, in 1948, the State of Israel was set up, which was a, a very historic uh, signpost, as it were, because it was necessary, as we shall see, for the Jews to have a nation, a statehood, in the land before Jesus could come back. And it was also necessary that they should possess Jerusalem, control Jerusalem, and that took place in 1967, when they had control of all Jerusalem. And then followed a period of anti-Semitism. Now, I know anti-Semitism has been rife for a long period of time, but it was especially intensified by 
the growing number of Jews back to their land, this increased the level of anti-Semitism, which is, runs at a, quite a high level at the moment, and, and that has been continuing down to our day. And today we have Israel in this interesting position of making alliances with other southern Arab nations and because of their uh, joint uh, afraid, being afraid of Iran and what Iran is wanting to do to the southern Arab states and to Israel. And so she's making alliances and again that is prophesied uh, in scripture. And also Israel very prosperous and again that's the picture that we shall see. And that is leading, I press my button just slightly too soon, but a, a northern power, the scripture tells us, will come down and take possession of Egypt and Israel. And then finally, that battle of Armageddon that the Bible talks about will take place and Israel's enemies will be destroyed. So those are some of the stepping stones, things that have happened, a lot of them in my lifetime, uh, which indicate to us that though we've been waiting a long time for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, so many things have been happening in my lifetime that convince me that we're getting closer and closer to this time of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now before we look at scripture, I just want us to look at one of our old books, Self is Israel, written by John Thomas 150 years ago. And the only reason why I'm putting this up is that people say to us, well, it's very easy for you to, uh, in hindsight, fit scripture to events. So here's a man who was living a hundred years before the State of Israel was set up uh, and wrote in this book called Helpless Israel, The Hope of Israel, because he understood that was what the gospel is all about, this uh, Jesus being king of the Jews and gathering followers to him. He, he made it from his reading of scriptures, he was able to see what was going to happen, and which is, say, lay uh, 50, 100 years ahead of his time. Um, and he, he had this to say. There is then a partial and primary restoration of the Jews before the manifestation of the coming of the Lord Jesus. So he's saying before Jesus comes back, there's got to be Jews coming back to their land. The pre-eventual colonisation of Palestine, that's what Israel's called them, will be on purely political principles. And these are all things that is gained from studying the scriptures. The Jewish colonists will return in unbelief of their messiahship of Jesus and of the truth as it is in him. They will emigrate thither as agriculturalists and traders in the hope of ultimately establishing their commonwealth, but more immediately of getting rich in silver and gold by commerce um, with India and in cattle and goods by their industry at home under the effective protection of the British power. That's quite remarkable statements, isn't it? But all those, and we haven't got time to look at them tonight, but all those are statements which one can find scriptural passages to support. And he, from his reading of the Bible, was able to see this is what would happen, and indeed, that is what did happen. So, let's look at uh, one of those aspects about the return of the Jews back to their land. So, if we go to uh, Ezekiel, this is one of many passages which speak about the Jews being scattered throughout all the countries of the earth, and yet coming back, not to any old land, but back to their original homeland, to the land of Israel. And so here is Ezekiel writing just at the time when they were just beginning to be scattered. And he says, and note this is not Ezekiel's words, he is the mouthpiece for the Lord God, Although I remove them, Israel, afar off among the nations, though I scatter them among the countries, yet I have been a sanctuary to them for, to them for a while in the countries where they have gone. Therefore, say, thus saith the Lord God, I will gather you from the peoples and assemble you out of the countries where you have been scattered, and I will give you the land of Israel. So, although they were scattered two and a half thousand years ago by the Babylonians and by the Romans two thousand years ago, and they've gone to every country of the world, yet God made this promise, written two thousand six hundred years ago, that they would come back eventually, back to their homeland, where they originally were. 
And it goes on to say, and when they come there, they will remove from it all its detestable things and all its abominations, that they may walk in my statutes and keep my rules and obey them. And they shall be my people, and I will be their God. Now, that has not yet been fulfilled. We're, we're in this exciting period where we can see, yes, they have come back to their homeland, but until the Lord Jesus comes back and is their king, uh, until that, they are in unbelief. But when Jesus comes back, then they will be God's people and I will be their God. So we're in the cusp of the fulfilment of these things with the return of the Lord Jesus. So, as I say, that's just one of many passages that there are that speak of the return of the Jews back to their homeland. So let's look at some of these stepping stones. That, that very first enigmatic one, whichever screen you're looking at, it's very difficult for two screens. Um, Turkey dried up. Actually, it is a scriptural quotation. It comes from the book of Revelation, and the period in the uh, history that is given in that book of God's judgment, starting in the French Revolution, uh, and the events that followed on from that to, on to our day and into the future, Revelation chapter 16. And as part of the process uh, in this symbolic book, it talks about the river Euphrates, the great river Euphrates, being dried up. Now, the river Euphrates um, runs uh, all the way up to Turkey. And if a river dries up, then that indicates that there is a lack of water at the source, doesn't it? And so, because this is uh, symbols, it's not talking about the river literally drying up, but the power that lies at the beginning of this river, Turkey, is to have its empire shrunk back. And we can illustrate uh, that if we look at in 1683, that is the Turkish Empire, the Ottoman Empire, at its greatest extent, up to the walls of Vienna and into North Africa here, huge empire. Yet, step by step, it was all lost. And when we come to the beginning of the World War I, 1914, it had shrunk down to uh, just the Middle East there. And at the end of the war, um, it, it disappeared even more and uh, is <coughs> Turkey as we have it today. And so, yes, we can see that, that that's what it was talking about, the drying up of the river Euphrates, the Turkish Empire shrinking back to where we have it now. And in reality, there is still another step of uh, shrinking of the river Euphrates because we're looking, going to look at Russia coming down into Syria. She's also going to come down into Turkey. And when that happens, then the river Euphrates will be completely dried up. But why was it dried up? Well, Revelation tells us that it was in order that the way might be prepared for the kings from the east. Uh, remember, again, this is symbology. It's not literal kings coming from the east. This is a symbol of the Lord Jesus Christ and his followers coming to uh, save the nation of Israel in their time of extremity. And the Turkish power was in possession of the land of Israel up till the First World War. And it was necessary for that power to be pushed back in order that the Jews could go back. And if we just read on a few more verses, we can see it's linked to the coming of the Lord Jesus, because it goes on to say, Behold, I, and that's the Lord Jesus speaking to John, I'm coming as a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake and keeps his garment on, that he may not go about naked and be exposed. And they assemble themselves at the place that in the Hebrew is called Armageddon. Now, the place where Hebrew is spoken is in Israel. So this drying up was very necessary in order for Israel to establish itself as a state. And we can see, if you read the dates on the map there, that the World War I, the events of that completely changed the whole uh, layout of the Middle East, enabling Egypt and Israel, Lebanon, and all these nations to gain their independence. Now, the... Pushing back of Turkey through the land of Israel 
wasn't something that uh, had been really planned as far as Britain was concerned. In World War I, Turkey came in on the side of Germany, much to people's surprise. Uh, but that meant that Russia, who was an ally of Britain, who had her fleet at Sevastopol in the Crimea, was unable to get her ships out into the Mediterranean because they had to come through these narrow passages that we just... Uh, some reason my clicker refuses to work, but um, these narrow passages here, uh, and with the Turkish guns on the high lands, there was no way that the Russian ships could get their way through there. So uh, Russia tried to attack, and she wanted to take Istanbul, Constantinople, uh, and the British uh, attacked from this side, but it was all a terrible disaster. And the Gallipoli campaign in World War I resulted in the death of hundreds, thousands of British and Australian and New Zealand soldiers. And they were pulled out in January 1916, having got nowhere. So the Gallipoli campaign was an abject failure. Uh, at the same time, there was the Mesopotamia, Mesopotamia campaign, and Britain was trying to get into uh, Turkey, to the Ottoman Empire, up through the river Euphrates, but again, they didn't get very far. And so it was felt necessary that they should attack through Palestine, which wasn't their original intention, but that's what God wanted them to do. And so he caused these to be failures so that they could concentrate. And so the men that were pulled out from the Gallipoli and men from the Mesopotamia came on the Sinai campaign and successfully swept up because uh, that eventually um, gave them possession of Jerusalem in December 1917. And that's a picture of Allenby walking into Jerusalem in his respect. He wouldn't ride. He walked into the city and the city was handed over to the British to um, run. The whole area was uh, handed over to the British. Now, a month before that was uh, what we call the Balfour Declaration, when the British government made this declaration that I could see that Britain was advancing up through Palestine, that... Uh, Britain would allow the Jews to go back and have a homeland there. And there was much rejoicing within our community um, when this was declared, because one could see, well, this is the hand of God, this is what scripture being fulfilled, this is a signpost along the journey to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then because of Britain having control and allowing the Jews to go back, there was uh, an influx of uh, Jews going back. And when we come to... Uh, 1948, when the State of Israel was set up, then the, the line goes even more steeply. So we have um, 8.4 million Israelis, of which uh, 6.3 are Jews. Uh, there's about 7.9 in the diaspora, so about 43% of the world's Jews are now living back in the land. And 1948 was the declaration that Israel should have a state. And again, there was great rejoicing within our community at that time. But scripture makes it clear that they also have to be in possession of Jerusalem. And scriptures like this one in Zechariah chapter 12 speaks of a, a time when the enemies of Israel come against them and it's clear that Israel is in possession of Jerusalem. It's going to become a cup, a cup of trembling, um, a burdensome stone to all people. Now all the peoples of the earth be gathered together against it. So it is clear when we read scripture that it was necessary for the Jews to be in possession of uh, Jerusalem. And that uh, came to pass in uh, 1967 when they managed to take the old city of Jerusalem and control the whole of the city. And these iconic pictures of the Jews at the Western Wall, the Wailing Wall, uh, on the 7th of June in that year. So all Jerusalem was and is uh, under their control. Now, it's still a burning issue, isn't it, between the Jews and the Arabs, uh, and between the uh, Christian organisations and Israel. The fact that Israel uh, possesses Jerusalem it is uh, a burning question, uh, and one that we can see will grow uh, and cause nations to come against Israel. Now, 
well, this talk is all about Russia, let's start mentioning Russia. Let's look at things from the viewpoint of Russia. She looks down upon uh, a, a world which uh, is much warmer. Uh, she looks down to the Middle East. She sees the vast uh, reserves of oil and gas which lie off the coasts of uh, Syria and Lebanon and Israel and Egypt. She also is very interested in two cities, the city of Constantinople, Istanbul today, and the city of Jerusalem, for two reasons. It was from Constantinople that the religion of Russia, the Russian Orthodox religion, originated. Over a, hundred, a thousand years ago, uh, the people of Crimea and U Ukraine of today uh, became uh, Orthodox Christians, and from there it then moved up into uh, Russia, as we shall see in a moment. So that, that Constantinople was very important to them. That was the birthplace of their religion. Religion plays a big part in uh, the politics of Russia today. And when it fell in 1453 to the Ottomans, to the Muslims, uh, this was a, a terrible thing for them. And uh, they uh, are looking for the day when they can retake that city. And if you go to the Kremlin, you'll see on the churches the cross over the crescent and if you ask the guy you know what does that mean and they'll tell you well we're looking for the day when Russia will retake Constantinople and will expunge the, uh, the terrible things of 1453 it's in their psyche to take Constantinople uh, and that's what the scriptures uh, confirm to Jerusalem is of interest to them because this is the birthplace of Christianity and again, the Russian Orthodox Church does possess a lot of property in Jerusalem. The Knesset, the Israeli parliament, is on Russian Orthodox ground. The um, residence of the Prime Minister is on Russian Orthodox ground. So they have a lot of possessions there. Now, they don't like the idea of Jews being in control of their holy places. And uh, this is all part of a movement that will see them coming to take possession of Jerusalem so that they can control it. But that's how Russia looks down from the frozen north southwards to the warm and pleasant land. But let's see how God views it from the words of his prophets he views it that Russia is to the north, and Moscow is due north of uh, Jerusalem. And uh, let's take a reading from Ezekiel chapter 38. Because here is a wonderful picture, and if you've got Bibles, you know, you want, might want to turn, because you're going to look at uh, quite a few verses in this uh, chapter. Uh, but in Ezekiel chapter 38, it describes a power to the north of Israel, who comes down against Israel and is eventually defeated on the mountains of Israel by a power that eventually turns out to be the Lord Jesus Christ, Israel's Messiah. Now these words were written about 580 BC, so two and a half thousand years ago. And uh, Ezekiel 38 opens with this description of a power, a leader, and uh, the countries that he is associated with. The word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, set your face toward Gog of the land of Magog, the chief prince of, or the marginal note in the ESV says, uh, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Jubal. Prophesy against him and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Jubal. Now we'll put those uh, on the map in a moment, but uh, it continues. Uh, I will put I will turn you about and put hooks into your jaws and I will bring you out and all your army, horses and horsemen, all of them clothed in full armour, a great host, all of them with buckler and shield, wielding swords. Just pause there. So this is a picture of what is going to happen in the latter days and that will be revealed in the verses that follow. Here is a power that is very warlike. 
they've got an army, horses, horsemen, um, great host. I mean, in today's language, uh, bucklers and shields, wielding swords. Today's language, we could say, with tanks and aeroplanes and anti uh, aircraft missiles and all the rest of it. So, uh, a warlike, uh, a body of people who are very military. And God says, I'm going to turn you about. Which would indicate that this power is going in the wrong direction, as it were. But God has to cause things to happen to turn them about. And maybe this is a reference to the fall of the Soviet power. Under the Soviets, the church was suppressed. That wasn't what was in God's plan. Uh, Russia had to be a, a nation like it was in the time of the Tsars, with church and state working together. So they were going in the wrong direction. And God had to turn them round, as it were, and cause them to be a military power again, and cause them to come forth from the north uh, down into his land. Now, that time hasn't come, but we've seen the preparations for that. But Gog and, uh, of the land of Magog is not alone. His prince of Rosh, Meshach and Chubal, and so we'll see where they fit in in a moment. But he's got companions with him. Uh, Persia, Cush, Foot are with him. All of them with shield and helmets are equally well armed. Goma and all his hordes. Beth to Gama from the uttermost parts of the north, all his hordes. Many peoples are with you. Be ready and keep ready, you and all your hosts that are assembled about you, and be a guard for them. So this is God, as it were, speaking to Gog, this leader of this uh, confederation of nations. And he says, you've got to be a guard for them. And note the language, it's not a guard over them. These are not prisoners. These are fellow uh, soldiers, as it were. But he is the guard. He's the one that's providing them probably with most of the equipment and the ammunition and that and the leaders and the direction. So, a confederation of nations. Now, these are all listed uh, in the table there. So, we have um, Gog's kingdom uh, is associated with Magog, Rosh, Meshach, Tubal, and his companions, Persia, Cush, Foot, Goma, and Tagama. Now, interestingly, these are all nations which we read of in the scriptures, in the Bible. Go back to uh, Genesis chapter 10. We see that these are descendants, two of them, uh, Cush and Phut, Libya and uh, Ethiopia, are descendant from Ham, and the, which are the African nations, the sons of Japheth, moved into Europe and populated Europe. And we can see that most of his sons are represented in the list here, from Goma, and his son was Tagama. Magog, Madai and the Medes, the Persians, Tubal, Meshach, Tyrus, as the Ross, so we shall look at that in a moment. But no, there they are uh, in uh, Genesis chapter 10. And most of the names are unchanged, but some of them have. But our special interest is in Tyrus, uh, who we shall see is Ross, which is Russia. So is Go, Prince of Rosh? And Rosh is the ancient, Rus is the ancient name for Russia. Here's just a few quotes from the Cyclopaedia Britannica. Russia is derived through Rossia, from the Slavonic Rus or Ross. Rosh, proper name of a northern nation, undoubtedly the Russians, says Jacinius. Among the Greeks, the national appellation for the Russians has had a singular Ross, so among the Greeks they call them the Ross. <coughs> That's given in its decline and fall. And Terzis says the Tauri are expressly called the Ross. Now, the Tauri, or the descendants of uh, Tyrus, if we just uh, look at them out, but all, all the, it's a bit of a diversion, but all the descendants of Noah, we can trace how they moved because they left their names to places and rivers and cities and countries. If we just uh, enlarge that section there, you'll see that Tyras, the uh, younger son of Japheth, moved over, gave his name to the city that's still there to this day, uh, and the river Danista used to be called the river Tyrus. Uh, so they moved into this area, into uh, Ukraine of today. And uh, it is there that the uh, Russian 
empire really began in Ukraine and northward. That's showing it at its greatest extent in the 1100s. But because of pressure from the south, the Mongols swept in in 1240, pushed up the um, power from Kiev northwards, and the uh, Kiev was at that time the centre of the uh, Russian Orthodox Church. It had to move because of this pressure from Mongols who were not uh, Christian at all, and eventually coming to Moscow in 1322 and establishing then Moscow as the centre of the Russian Empire. But it, it started down in the south here in the area where Tyrus um, uh, settled. And so when we have this list, Gog is associated with the land of Magog, which we haven't time to look at, but uh, we trace that to Germany. Rosh is the name of Russia. Meshek is the ancient name for Moscow and Tubal Tobolsky. Persia is today's Iran. Kush was Ethiopia, Sudan around there. Libya hasn't changed terribly much, and Goma. Um, moved right out, it went originally Turkey and then moved out to France and Tagama seems to be up the north, just Georgia, Armenia around that region there. So these are just countries which are named, there are others with them, but an assembly of people that are coming against God's people as we're going to see in a moment. And the thing to note is the vast majority of those countries we would term Christian, um, the Libyans and the Ethiopians are Muslims, but uh, the vast majority are Christian countries there. And they're going to come against uh, Israel. In fact, other scriptures talk about a holy crusade against the Jewish people. And something is that the Christendom cannot see that God still has a purpose with his nation of Israel. Um, just as the Jews rejected Jesus when he first came, so sadly the Christians are going to reject the Lord Jesus when he comes the second time. But the invasion is going to be a, a very sad thing for the nation of Israel. And we'll read a bit more detail as we go on in uh, Ezekiel chapter 38. Uh, God is saying to go this Russian power, uh, after many days you will be mustered. In the latter years you will go against the land that is restored from war, the land whose people were gathered from many peoples upon the mountains of Israel, which had been continually waste. Its people were brought out from the peoples that now dwell securely, all of them. You will advance, coming on like a storm. You will be like a cloud covering the land, you and your many hordes and many peoples with you. Now remember, this is written two and a half thousand years ago, and really it sends a shiver down your back, doesn't it? Because we can see just how accurate this is, that we believe we're in these latter days. And yes, this land which was desolate for centuries no longer is desolate. It is inhabited by the Jews who were scattered but have come back. Uh, and as we shall see later on, they become rich and prosperous. Uh, if you doubt about the uh, words that are here, when Mark Twain visited Palestine in 1867, he talked about it being a desolate country whose soil is rich enough, but it's given over wholly to weeds, a silent, mournful expanse, a desolation. We never saw a human being on the whole route, hardly a tree or shrub anywhere. So uh, that's just exactly what uh, Ezekiel was saying. 2,600 years ago. A desolate land, but no longer desolate because the Jews have come back. And the Jews have come back. So in that day, you're going to think, uh, your come, thoughts will come to your mind. You'll devise an evil scheme and say, I will go up against the land of unwar villages. I will fall upon the quiet people who dwell securely, all of them dwelling without walls or having no bars or gates, to see spoil and to take off plunder, to turn your hand against the waste places as are now inhabited, and the people who were gathered from the nations who acquired livestock and goods who dwell in the centre of the land or centre of the earth, centre of the land. So it's quite clear the final destination of Gog and all this army is to come against Israel at a time when they are dwelling securely and perhaps as we shall speculate in moments, uh, with Russia having 
planted her feet in uh, Syria. Maybe we shall get this period of stability for a short time before this onward roll into the land of Israel. So Israel's enemies are going to come against and the rest of the chapter and the following chapter describe how these enemies are destroyed um, by uh, a mighty power who turns out to be their Messiah. So what we're anticipating is there's times going to come when the nation of Israel as we know it today is going to disappear and in its place are going to be these enemies who have come and taken Jerusalem. So that's the stepping stone northern power not only takes Israel also takes uh, Israel. So let's have a look and see at the onward step of Russia. She's preparing, has been preparing for quite a long time um, to plant her feet in the Middle East. Um, 1993, shortly after the overthrow of communism, uh, there was a part of Georgia which broke away and said we want to remain with the Russians. And 2008, uh, remember when Putin moved the Russian troops, when everybody's eyes were focused on the Olympic Games in Beijing, uh, that's when he poured his troops uh, into there and there are now two areas in Georgia which are Russian influenced and are very much under Russian control. Last year we saw him take Crimea and last year and this year he's been operating in the eastern part of the Ukraine. He's also last year um, planted his feet uh, on the other side of Ukraine, uh, enlarging the military airfields there so they can take big uh, transporter planes so when the time comes to move further into Ukraine he has made the preparations. Uh, and this year we have seen the build up of troops on Crimea and uh, establishing that as a, an advanced headquarters for his next move and we've seen that next move which has been to um, come down into Syria. Now, in February, he got permission from the Cypriots to have a naval base, or make use of the naval base of uh, Cyprus. Um, but a few months ago, uh, we have seen him plant his feet in Syria. Uh, he has moved his ships uh, off the coast of Syria. Um, and, uh, you know, he has firmly planted himself there. He also has got quite a presence in Iran and uh, just in the past um, less than a month uh, they've been establishing a big base in Iraq to the west of Baghdad. And we also saw, um, just, uh, sorry it's just off the map isn't it, um, him planting his feet there by having his ships fire these um, missiles, cruise missiles, uh, from the ships, and perhaps see a bit better on that one there. Um, and these uh, fearsome weapons uh, travelling at vast speeds and covering about 900 miles were fired from the Caspian Sea right across into the ISIS territory of Raqqa and into the Syrian uh, territory around Aleppo. Uh, quite a frightening escalation in um, the warfare that you can position your ships 900 miles away and just press the buttons and these cruise missiles will follow their path and strike their targets. They didn't all strike the targets, some of them did fall short but the vast majority did. So he has established uh, and enlarged the airport at Latakia and uh, put in um, accommodation, enlarge the runways, so troops and men and aircraft are at Takia. But the, um, the Basel al-Assad, so again, similar things, spend a lot of money enlarging it, putting in troops and weaponry there. Um, down in the south, Tartus is the naval base that they have, and again there's talk of enlarging that. It's built another third base further into Syria at Tama in the past three weeks and at Tyas uh, again past few weeks. Um, the base that he has put in, as I say, to the west of um, Baghdad 
is in Iraq there. So he is planting his feet rather firmly in this uh, area. And by positioning ships with missiles uh, off the coast there, he has got most of Syria covered. And as I say, he has now facilities to use at uh, Cyprus. Now, Assad's hometown is in the hills near the uh, Basel al-Assad airport. And this is the, that by the coastal uh, region there is where Assad's troops have been pushed back to. They used to control the whole of Syria, but now they have lost so much to ISIS and the so-called rebel troops. So Putin is keen to support Assad, but there's more to it than that. And this article in the Cyprus Mail, 18th of October, pulls it all together. Whoever still thinks the war in Syria is about toppling Bashar al-Assad's regime or annihilating ISIS militants is surely mistaken. From the onset, this war has been about one thing only, to control the eastern Mediterranean. The ultimate victor of this long, brutal war will not only become the new authority in the region, but the heart that pumps the blood around the entire world. A Russian victory in Syria, therefore, could result in the birth of a new axis of power in the eastern Mediterranean, where Western influence has been waning. And that, I believe, is what is behind it all. This is an advancement uh, for Russia. He's wanting to move into the whole of the Middle East. Here he has seized the opportunity when America has been wavering to put his troops into Syria to fight the battles. As far as Putin is concerned, Assad is a valuable ally, but it does seem that even Assad's um, tenure is coming to an end and there are now talks about him going and maybe other members of his family taking over. But what Putin very much is afraid of is that these so-called rebel troops in Syria are very much people who have come from Chechnya and the Northern <coughs> Caucasus areas and if they gain a victory in Syria then they will then turn and use their newfound wealth and weaponry against uh, Russia itself. So he is determined that he is going to be victorious in Syria. And uh, uh, there's not much that the West can do. It's a very expensive war. Uh, it is running Russia's reserves down. Um, they have shrunk because of the falling value of the oil down to about $515 billion. Um, military expenditure is on the rise and it has been estimated that it's costing about $4 million uh, a day. What it's doing in there plus the cost of the cruise missiles. Mind you, that's a fairly small chunk of 5.15. Uh, it's estimated that by the end of the year, 38 million of that 5.15, uh, $515 billion will have been uh, used up, wiped out. But don't write Russia off. She has a wonderful opportunity to increase her arms sales as nations see the incredible effect of the weapons that she has developed. As I say, there is a growing consensus that Assad will probably disappear. He was summoned to Moscow and uh, told that probably he's not part of the solutions and they are planning to have elections in Syria. But at the moment, everything is very flexible. Uh, Ten days ago, there was a meeting in Vienna, uh, which seemed to go quite well. And there was supposed to be a meeting uh, on Friday, but that doesn't seem to have taken place. So they're trying to find a solution to the dreadful situation um, in Syria where there has been such carnage and bloodshed and caused so many refugees. But we shall just have to wait and see. Now, Russia went in under the guise of dealing with ISIS. 
And we know the problems that ISIS has been causing. Um, just 13 days ago, they brought down this Russian jet over Sinai, killing 224 on, sorry, last Thursday. A lot of people overlooked this, but there was a dreadful bombing in Beirut, which uh, killed 43 and injured 250. And then, of course, on Friday, what the Paris papers call the carnage of Paris, the horror. 129 dead, 352 plus wounded. So within 13 days, they have killed nearly 400 people across a vast stretch of territory, ranging from Sinai to Beirut to France. No wonder people are frightened. Where is it going to end? And we know why France was targeted, because of she is helping in the bombings in Syria. Britain is likewise helping the bombings in Syria. So such a destruction could easily take place in this country. Now one of the signs that Jesus gave to us of his coming was that the people will be frightened. There will be signs and the sun, moon and stars on the earth, distress of nations and perplexity because of the roaring of the seas and the waves, people fainting with fear and foreboding of what is coming on the world, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud of power and great glory. Now when these things begin to take place, straighten up, raise up your heads, because your redemption is drawing near. So Jesus is saying that at the time when he is coming back, using the figurative language, not literal sun, moon and stars, but using those to talk of the powers that be, the ruling powers, parliaments, governments, uh, and the sea and the waves, the people, this is exactly what we're seeing. People are very frightened about what is happening. But he said to the, his followers, take heed, straighten up, lift up your heads, because my coming is very near. So we take great comfort with that. Now, Russia went into Syria to, as I say, deal with ISIS, and, but has been directing most of his bombs and weaponry against the, the rebel people. And this is uh, slightly tongue-in-cheek by this uh, cartoonist, Shrank, who usually does the cartoons for me and milestones. I hear Putin's joining in, but there's nothing left to bomb. Well, that, that's a bit of an exaggeration, but uh, there has been terrible destruction in Syria. And as uh, a result of that, the world is now looking at Russia, who has planted herself firmly in Syria, as being the one who is in a position to help deal with ISIS. And the interesting thing with this bring down the airplane, the events in Beirut, the events in Paris, and whatever lies ahead, it is bringing the West together to say to Russia, look, we've got to work with you. Let's deal with ISIS. Let's wipe ISIS out. Because the results of what is happening in Syria is so frightening. The mass emigration is on a scale that the world hasn't seen for a long, long time. Boatloads of people, columns of people marching away from Syria from the warfare, working their way up through Europe. So who is ISIS? Does it feature in Bible prophecy? And yes, I think it does. But we just need to slot in uh, another prophecy. And so let's just speed things up because I see time has gone on much longer than I thought. Daniel chapter 11 paints a picture of the latter day it's a parallel picture with what we've had from Ezekiel chapter 38 of a, a northern power coming like a whirlwind with ships overflowing, coming into the glorious land, um, various countries escaping, coming against Egypt. Egypt's going to be taken. Uh, the Libyans and the Kushites are going to uh, be working with this northern power. Um, and he's going to eventually plant his in the ESV, palatial tents between the sea and the glorious holy mountain, in other words, in Jerusalem. 
So this power is going to come down initially into Egypt, come back up into Israel, destroy Israel as a nation, and plant his headquarters um, in Jerusalem. But scripture says he shall come to his end because by that time the Lord Jesus will have come back. Now, uh, let me just skip that because we haven't time to uh, deal with that. Just want to go very briefly then to Numbers chapter 2 and we're going back BC 1400. And I think this gives us a hint that there is to be a power in the Middle East that is opposed to Russia, is opposed to Iran which could very well be the ISIS power that we see today. And this very ancient prophecy is about Agag. Now Agag was the title of the Amalekites who were a nation that came against Israel on their wilderness journey, tried to destroy them, and it's used in scripture as a symbol of those who oppose Israel. And this prophecy says that Israel's king is going to be victorious over Agag. He's going to be higher than Agag. And Israel's kingdom is going to be ex exalted. Ag uh, Amalek was the first among the nations, but its end is utter destruction. But ships shall come from Kittim and shall afflict Asher and Eber, and he too shall come to utter destruction. So at a time when Israel's king is going to be victorious, against those who are Israel's enemies, the Amalekites. It has this enigmatic language that ships come from Kittim, which is associated with Cyprus, shall afflict Asher, which is between the two rivers, the Euphrates and the um, Tigris. Eber is the ancient name of Israel, but this power is going to come to an end. So, what we see there is this is where Isis is concentrated between the rivers, the Euphrates and the Tigris. Um, the uh, Mosul is where Nineveh used to be, the old Assyrian uh, capital. Raqqa is uh, where their current um, headquarters is. Now, this power fits exactly with what Balaam was talking about. A power where the Assyrian Empire was, who will be uh, in opposition to this northern power that comes down and takes uh, Kittim uh, and sweeps on into this area here. If we just put this map on, the day is going to come when Russia moves down into Turkey, takes Constantinople, uh, and takes get in where the British have their bases because if you're going to control this area you need to get rid of the British there and also from Blam's prophecy deals with Asher now why should she deal with Asher because there is a power there that is opposed to her and that's the Isis power she also comes down into Egypt and then makes her way back up into Israel and so in a wonderful way the, these um, things that the Bible has spoken of, you know, three and a half thousand years ago, come to life in our time. Uh, it's always been a puzzle because Iran has, uh, we know from Ezekiel, is friendly with Russia. So why should she come and seize Asher, which is roughly where Iran is, just beyond there. But you see, today we have this power that's there. So I think what is going to happen is that... Uh, Russia and the West will, will contain ISIS, so it's no longer a threat, but it's going to be there. They're not going to be able to eliminate it. And that hopefully will lead to a time of peace and stability for Israel to prosper. And that is the time when the Lord Jesus has already come back to his household, that then this onslaught of the northern nations, as described in Ezekiel 38, takes place. And Israel is broken. And that is the work of the Lord Jesus, having come back to save his people. So again, I just want to go back to that book, Help Us Israel, because uh, he wrote these fully uh, interesting words. He said, the future movements of Russia are notable signs of the times, and that's where we've been seeing the movements of Russia, because they are predicted in the scriptures of truth. When Russia makes its grand move for the building up of its image empire, then let the reader know that the end of all things as at present constituted is at hand. The long expected but stealthy advent of the King of Israel will be on the eve of becoming a fact. 
And so this is what excites us about Russia moving down into Syria. It is part of her forward movement so that she can then take Turkey and then she can roll onwards. It's telling us that the coming of the Lord Jesus is very, very close. So we've seen Putin seize Crimea last year. It is anticipation of this onward movement when he takes Turkey and rolls onwards and comes all the way down into Egypt and establishes his headquarters in Jerusalem. But eventually it will lead to the destruction of these nations and the Lord Jesus will establish his kingdom step by step worldwide. And so I'm just going to sit down, but I'm just going to leave you this passage just to read for yourselves. This is a lovely description in Isaiah chapter 2, which speaks of the situation that will be when eventually all nations submit to the Lord Jesus. And Jesus is king and the nations are at peace. This is the wonderful message of the Bible. We can be with the Lord Jesus, helping him in this day. And so the Lord has delayed his coming. That may be in order that we can be with him in that day. Thank you. And uh, arguably, what the world needs now is more Christadelphians. That's <laughs> <laughs> I've just rewritten the song. And the reason I say that is because Christadelphians um, are very very active in Northamptonshire and across the country but quite a few people don't really know what Christadelphians are all about and uh, they've got an event coming up on the 16th which is a week on Monday uh, where hopefully people become a bit more aware of what they do and the sort of things that they debate like big political events and so on but uh, David Pierce is from the Christadelphians in Northampton and joins me now in the studio good morning to you good morning Martin so you do have a church in Northampton yes we do and also Kettering, Bedford, North Am Rugby, um, all around here, and oh. all over the world too, actually. Yeah, where's the, where's the church in Northampton then? In St Michael's Road, not far from here. It's probably a building people sort of drive past every day it and is. not it's really a work out. Street, yes. Yeah, and don't know what, don't know exactly what the building is. But in a nutshell, can you explain what Christadelphians are? Well, our point of view really is we try to imitate as closely as possible the first century church both in what we believe, our practices, our organisation. We, we read the Bible and we say that's how things were at the beginning when Christianity was pure. Because the apostles warned after their deaths, men would bring in false teachings and wrong mm. ideas into the church. Mm. So we say, right, let's go back to the Bible, let's see what they did then. And so <clears throat> that's really where we start. And so, for example, if you come to our church, you won't find altars, you won't find incense, you won't even find the church. The building itself is very special because what's important is the people. Actually, you know, Martin, the, the beauty of first century Christianity was its simplicity. Yeah, yeah, okay, and, and all this sort of adornment was added later. Exactly, yes, to love God with all your heart, to, to walk and live with him, and to look after each other and love each other, even your enemies. Those are the two principal commandments that we try to follow. And of course, uh, as, all, as all Christians were instructed by Jesus, we remember his death and a resurrection in, in breaking bread and drinking wine on Sunday mornings. And uh, we believe in baptism too, as a, an entrance into the church, into Christ's body, as a, a first century doctrine, which is still very important. And like the first century Christians too, we believe in the second coming of Jesus to be a king on the earth. Do you, do you know when that's going to happen? Well, himself says nobody knows the, the day or the hour. God's keeping that up his own sleeve, so, so to speak. But he does give us signs, Jesus says, he, what the signs will be when he's going to come back again and one of the principal things of course is in Matthew 24 and Luke 21 is that men's hearts will be failing them for fear of what's coming on the earth we've certainly got to that kind of state today as we look around the world but in the Old Testament too we have many um, prophecies about what will happen at, in what it calls the last days the times when the, the present world comes to an end and the reign of Christ, the kingdom of God on the earth, begins. And that's what this talk is about next Monday, um, week on Monday, Monday 16th, yeah. at the Guildhall. Uh, the movement of Russia into Syria in the last few weeks is, is, a, is a tremendous sign because Bible prophecies actually tell us what's going to happen before Jesus comes. And one of those things is the great power from the north 
of Israel is going to move down south through Israel, right into Egypt, and, and take over that part of the world. And, <clears throat> and we've seen Russia putting stepping stones for that in Georgia, uh, over in Crimea in the last few few months, and, and now Syria. It's, it's all moving southwards, uh, preparing the way for this great invasion from the north, which will end with the destruction of the armies of God's enemies on the mountains of Israel and the beginning of uh, uh, Christ's return to the Mount of Olives and the beginning of God's kingdom on earth. But people have been seeing signs for years, for centuries of, of the second coming, of and to the best of our knowledge, it hasn't actually happened yet. Of course. Is there a danger in, in finding these signs and saying mm. to people, this is a sign of this happening, when it then doesn't? Mm. It, well, it, it doesn't really sort of do the, the, the reputation of the faith any good. Well, that's a good point. And the Apostle Peter, in his uh, letter, says, um, scoffers will come saying things have, have always been the same since the beginning of creation. Mm. Uh, and he said that the reason why God sometimes delays his plans is he wants to see if there's still one or two more people out there who might repent and come to him and be saved. Uh, and he waits until that time comes. And his big plan, he, he's allowed for that. So, um, Daniel, the prophet, in uh, um, who lived like 600 years before Christ he he wanted the kingdom of God to come in his day and he was very disappointed to be told by the angel Gabriel it's in Daniel chapter 9 and chapter 11 that things actually got a lot of things to take place before that will come yeah are you hoping it comes while you're still on earth I hope so Jesus does say uh, when he comes well Apostle Peter, uh, Paul says uh, when Jesus comes there will be some who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord and there will be others who have fallen asleep or died. And he said, actually, he said, those who are alive won't precede the ones who have fallen asleep, but they will all be gathered together to meet with Christ. Is it a growing religion then, the Christadelphians? It is growing in some countries like uh, Africa, particularly, growing very fast. And my wife, Catherine, and I are particularly involved with uh, the communities in, in Ukraine, yeah. uh, Russia, and um, uh, Kazakhstan. And uh, we have a steady trickle of baptisms there. People are coming along to from what was a Soviet background to finding out about the Bible. OK, so you've got this event on the 16th, yes. Monday the 16th, at the Guildhall 7.30, looking at sort of uh, some contemporary events, I guess, and but also linking it with the Bible and what the Christadelphians believe. Mm -hmm. OK, 7.30, Guildhall, Monday the 16th. David, thank you very much indeed for coming in, and uh, hopefully you'll be back as well at a later stage. Don't, don't be strangers now, <laughs> now you. we've met. Yeah. Uh, 29 minutes to nine on BBC Radio Northampton.